We've been given God the Holy Spirit. He is the ultimate guide. His function in the Godhead is to lead us into all truth. And you do that incrementally like with any subject. You learn it bit by bit and uh, you build up your spiritual frame of reference and then you go out of here and live it, hopefully, out there in the world uh, and whatever your association, uh, you uh, apply doctrine, hopefully, and uh, continue to improve your understanding of things. Uh, one of the things that uh, the Christian is supposed to be doing is building up their eternal rewards account. We have a verse, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. How do I do that? What's the ground rules for doing that? The ground rules for doing that is you do the works of God and you do it in fellowship. I can name all kinds of different things you can get reward for. Suffering of all kinds, shapes, just growing old. It's called the eternal weight of glory. Believers will all have a resurrection body, but they won't all be equal. There's gonna be an event when we all appear before Christ in the sky up above us at some distance. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. It's not to determine if you're saved. It is to, it's an evaluation of our works in time from the point we became a believer until the end. I'm gonna have, as I said the other day, I'm gonna have a bunch of human good. I've done things I, uh, that I was supposed to do and I wasn't in fellowship. So I'm not gonna get a reward for that. But what I did in fellowship, what I do in fellowship, I'm going to get a reward for. We call this SG3. The plan is divided into three parts. Phase one is salvation. Phase two is the believer in time, from the day you were saved until you get into the afterlife. Phase three, the afterlife. Uh, <clears throat> there, uh, all the people that are in heaven now uh, all the souls that are up there, uh, they're under uh, semi-ultimate sanctification. By that I mean there's one thing they want, that, uh, uh, there's, there's one thing for sure they want they don't have. They want their body back. And they want it in absolutely perfect condition. But everybody that's in heaven, even, even the dummies, believers that don't know much or have it all screwed up, they get downloaded with the entire mind of Christ. And they don't have to go to school. It's just downloaded. And uh, so when we get out of here via re resurrection, uh, all, the entire plan of God, there won't be any of us up there wondering about this or we'll be able to communicate with each other perfectly in the divine viewpoint realm, perfectly. So that's another advantage. Then we're gonna get our rewards. You know what the Bible says about SG3, don't you? Sure you do. Eye is not seen, ear is not heard. It hasn't entered into the imagination of man, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Those who love him are those, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my words and you'll do my works. What is, what is a, what's a symbol of love for one person? Just words? Words are nice, but if there's nothing behind them, it's just hollow. It doesn't mean anything. And actions, behavior. So the degree to which someone loves God is based on their commitment to his directive will. He has a directive will. Oh, by the way, uh, breaking the will of God down into three. See, we do things categorically here. It's like putting them in a, put them in a place that's not just a jumbled bunch of stuff jumbled out there. There's the geographical will. Where does God want me to live? He picks it. Or you pick it. Geographical will. Viewpoint will of God. What does God want me to think about fill in the blank? What's the divine viewpoint on this? And then, of course, there is the operational will of God. What does God want me to do? All right, continuing where we were from last time. Uh, <clears throat> we saw the in point 22, the purchase price of the, uh, of the false teachers of the blood of Christ or the spiritual death of Christ during the three hours of darkness on the cross. So you learned at Maranatha Church over the years, just, a, just an important point. It always bothered me back in the day too, until I heard a pastor teach it right. 
uh, it isn't the literal blood of Christ. He bled when the Romans whipped him. He bled in Pilate's court when they hit, when they, when they, when they stripped him and uh, beat his back with uh, leather straps with metal embedded in it. Woo! He bled a lot. And then, of course, he bled in connection with the crown of thorns. You get you get poked in the head with something, and you bleed like crazy up there. Then then he, he goes to the cross. He's nailed to a cross. Get this. There's a prophecy. It said not one bone of his body would be broken. How do you drive Roman spikes through, if it's the wrist or the hand and the legs, and not break a bone? There's all these bones in your hand and wrists, little tiny, all of them. It was a miracle. It was a flat miracle. So, uh, when we talk about the blood of Christ, animal blood was literal. They had to be bled out so they'd die. It's a representative analogy, not a direct analogy. We will still refer to it as the blood of Christ. We also refer to him as the Lamb of God, and we know he's not a sheep. You know? They didn't break this down and analyze it. You know what I am? Under God, uh, with my gift, I'm a detective. I follow things. How does it, does this piece fit, or do we just throw it out? Ignore it. No, we can't. And it doesn't happen overnight. Jesus' physical death didn't atone for sins. You see, from the end of the three hours until he expired, he had to avoid sin. If he had sinned one time in his entire history, he would have been disqualified as the Savior. He was tempted. Satan tempted him for 40 days under harsh conditions. After 40 days out in that wilderness, Satan comes on to him when he's at his weakest physically and gives him three offers and he refutes each one of them, what, how? With the scripture. And Satan left him. Satan wanted to get him to sin. One time, one time. After all, Adam and Eve sinned in innocence, as they call it. Did they not? They were created without a sin nature. They lived the, the, the amount of time from their creation until the fall. They lived that amount of time without sinning. And they were taught Bible doctrine every night by the Lord in the garden. The importance of Bible doctrine. You only have to make it here three times for four classes. That's all. We've had people come here and they're in pain, but they had to get their doctrine. This is their spiritual food. This is their lifeline. Because you're out there in the world, what, are you, what, what influences are you getting there? Whether it's at work or whatever it is. It's not divine viewpoint, usually. There may be examples of it, but you're not getting divine viewpoint, generally speaking. You need to be fed spiritually. Man shall not live by bread, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, this, 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 this is another one makes people mad. Jesus didn't bleed to death. The Roman soldier that put the spear up under him after he was dead proved that because the, the gospel writer says, it's translated, blood and water came out. You know what it is? It's perfectly medically correct. Blood and serum. It separates at death. <clears throat> yeah, the rapture is going to be funny if we're around. To, well, we'll all be around to see it, even if we're dead. Our body will pop out of a grave or out of an urn where a bunch of ashes are. Right in front of everybody. They will not be able to avoid it. Think this through. Here's a 12-year-old kid who's a believer. The rapture occurs. He's a 35-year-old man. Here's a 90-year-old. You got the picture? And there's and there and, and people are going to see this all over the earth. Cemetery, cemeteries are going to be a mess. Some of them. There may be some of them. <laughs> bunch of Muslim ones might not be so good but anyway anyway the ones in Jerusalem are gonna, that go way back in time they're going to be messed up too 
The, see, the pattern is Christ. The dead in Christ will rise first. They'll be this far ahead of us. Just bam. They will pop up first. If you've got, uh, you got the ashes of a loved one in your house and you're there at the house, they're going to pop up right in front of you. And you're not going to remember them like you'll remember them and then you're going to be changed in front of them. All right, can you imagine three generations? Daughter, mother, grand, grandmother. All of them are 35. Because we won't have, the resurrection body is just superior to everything. And that was, see, the Bible is quite correct scientifically. Adam and Eve ate of that fruit and it had the double whammy. It gave them an aging gene and it <coughs> implanted sin nature. Why do people do the things they do, awful things? They, they, they're feeding off of their sin nature. Sure, they get outside information too, but they have a sin nature. You can put yourself in isolation and your sin nature is still kick up. And you have, no con you have control over it because it isn't in the soul. The soul is where volition resides, free will. And we are made in the image of God and he has free will, we call it sovereignty. He does as he pleases. And the soul also has conscience. Some people, some people, it's completely wrecked. But it has a conscience. So the soul makes a decision to go with the sin nature, the flesh, it's called. Isn't that interesting? It's one of the synonyms under the doctrine of the STA, sinful trend of Adam. One of the synonyms is flesh because it's embedded in the cells, specifically the cells of your brain and nerve, central nervous system. And it seeks to impose its agenda on the real you. Yes, you can, get a, you can get input by bad examples and, and stuff out there, but it comes from, from, the, from within you. And, oh, wretched man that I am. This is the great apostle talking. Who will deliver me from this? I die daily. You can take that two ways. I get out of fellowship every day, or I isolate my STA every day, and I'm dead to my STA. When you're ruled by your STA, it's in the up position. When you hit 1 John 1, 9, and you don't have to remember everything you did in the last three hours. Maybe you weren't paying attention. Uh, you got upset because some dummy doesn't know how to drive. <laughs> okay, and whatever it is. And you forgot about that, maybe. Generic rebound works. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. In the, in the model prayer, Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. Jesus never had to rebound because he never committed a sin. The Bible says no sin was found in him. It's, it's hard to imagine that you, you, could, you, could, you could do a sin of ignorance. Oh, I didn't know that was a sin. Uh, the marquee sin of the Exodus generation. Saw all the miracles up out of Egypt. You know what their marquee sin was? It wasn't the golden calf incident. They complained constantly. Nothing pleased them. God's given them water out of a rock, not just a little stone or a, a big boulder. It's that rock back there on the board, five stories high, the rock at Rafidim. It still stands there. It's got water marks on it. Millions of gallons of water came out during their time of encampment there. Who do you, who, where do you think all their animals and everybody got cleaned up and ate and drank? Water out of a, water doesn't come out of a rock. I mean, unless there's some subterranean thing going on. But what, a, a rock that stands five stories high and the thing is kind of irregular, but it's split. Not all the way through. The picture there has a man standing in it. The rock at Rafida. And it's also symbolism. Christ was struck for our sins and out comes eternal life. That's the picture. It's all through the Bible, these things. What we're trying, what we've uh, uh, done here at Maranatha Church is get this in front of people. And yes, I've grown in knowledge and understanding too. 
the, the good stuff I had coming in. Then I had to, I had to change some things, got to add some things. That's just the way it is. And the last one, and I'd been praying this. I don't know why. I was just stirred up. Father, is there something big I'm missing? I mean, I got salvation right. And I got the Christian way of life, what you're supposed to be doing and uh, rebound and on and on. I got to, is there something big? Well, there was. The flat domed earth. <clears throat> Took me two years before I taught it because I had to be able to defend it from the standpoint of the Bible and simple common sense that this wouldn't work. And when I was in school, I didn't, I should, I should have, one of the best courses they should have is logic. They ought to teach you basic logic and advanced logic. Here's a paper, read it, find out what the problem is in it. What doesn't fit. You, you use logic every day of your life or you, you perish. Sometimes called common sense. Backward societies can figure the, some of these things out. They don't have to. But when you're in the devil's world, you have so many people that are God haters. They don't want to know God. And that's why they reverted to things like evolution. It rules God out. Why did the ancient pagans have all these deities and everything they, they religiously followed? It says it in Romans 1. They did not want God in their thinking. God reveals himself inaudibly through his creation. You look at it and you say, how'd that get here? And all the rest of it around it. And the concept of an all-powerful, Creator is in their brains, but they don't want it. So when they push that truth, there's a whole psalm devoted, not the whole psalm, half of it. God reveals himself through creation. We arrive at God awareness at a certain age. It might vary. It might be, it might be I don't know, different ages of kids. They become God aware, supreme being, even atheists. <laughs> atheists. They obviously became aware of it and then just said there is no God, dogmatically. There's a Psalm 19. The heavens reveal the glory of God, the power of God. Day unto day, night unto night, where there's no words, there's observation. How'd that get here? I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I wasn't raised in an atheist home. We just didn't go to church. We lived out on a ranch in South Dakota, around the Hot Springs area, cattle and sheep ranch. That's where I was raised. And then when I went to the town, Hot Springs, I tried to go to churches. I was looking for something. Well, the first one I went to was Catholic. I didn't learn nothing. Then I went over to a Protestant one where they had Baptists, Methodists, and Presbyterians under one roof. You could pick what baptism you want. Sprinkling, pouring, or immersion. <laughs> Honestly. And I'd sit there and he'd he, he read a scripture. And go, oh, God, he's going to explain it. Nothing. Go off, talk about his golf game or something. And make some analogies. So I got cynical. There wasn't even, in that, in that town of 5,000, there, there was not even a fundamentalist church like we see around here. Well, they, there's all kinds of versions of those. People, some people, my, uh, people I talk, talk to tell me some of the crazy stuff's going on in these churches now, just to get people in there. And uh, so my dad had to go broke in the, in the sheep business due to coyotes. And they had integrity and they wouldn't file, he wouldn't file bankruptcy. He, went, he, he worked, in, he worked in, uh, 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 the VA hospital there as a nurse's aide, that means carrying you know what around. And then they went to St. Louis and he worked in procurement and my mother was a secretary with the government. But they took me to St. Louis, that's where I needed to go. I could have gone somewhere else, but I went to St. Louis. 
And I had a friend in high school who invited me to church. And I'm going, oh, here we go again. And that's where I got the gospel. Well, I didn't get it the first time. Because I, you know what? I walked in with an attitude. And that just kills everything. The next thing I said, I, I'm just, and, and the, the guy gave the gospel and I believed. That's my quest up the ladder to truth. And I was only 16. Then I, then, I, then I get to get in the ministry and get down to Conway, Arkansas and go to Bible school where, I, where, I, where I'm, I'm, I, I'm book poor. I'm buying all these books, Greek lexicons, Hebrew. And I wanted that. They didn't have a Hebrew course. They had a Greek one. And that's when I got on doctrine while I was at that school. And I evangelized all my friends I could. I gave them the rebound booklet. And I said, you tell me what's wrong with this. And I don't want you just to get mad and, well, no, you tell me what's wrong with this. One friend said, well, that just eliminates walking aisles, doesn't it? <laughs> I said, it sure as heck does. <laughs> well, what is it going to do walking aisle? Then everybody knows, what'd he do? You know, walk an aisle. I'll give you the gospel. You can sit there and you can believe now or you can believe later. I can give you the doctrine. You can rebound now or later. And away we go. I give you the privacy of the priesthood. I'm going to drag you out in front of people. That's all gimmicks. It's all for show. You didn't get anywhere. But when I first heard Bible doctrine from a pastor in a church in Houston, not only the content, but his approach. And he spoke as one with authority. I don't mean of being a bully. I mean authority. This God gives authority to legitimate communicators. Just like authorities exist out here, legitimate ones that might exist. They've been given authority. They've been given a mandate by their superiors in the system that is set up. The, the, the prophets and the apostles and all these men who went out and ministered, they had authority. Yes, you can abuse it. You shouldn't be a spiritual, have a bully pulpit. And, or be, you know, let, let them push you around. You know, like I've heard stories about board of deacons trying to manipulate the pastor. They've tried it around here in the past. It hasn't worked. I'm not intimidated. God put me here. And he's kept me here in spite of the opposition from time to time that rises up inevitably because people are either jealous or they want the power or they want whatever it is. They're not content. They just sit there and learn Bible doctrine and function under their spiritual gift and go home and do their thing. They want something. Any, anybody that's ever called up here and said, I'd like to come to your church and teach. What? You're not welcome. That mentality. You're not going to teach. <laughs> Please. So, so we can pretty well protect ourselves uh, with regard to the, the, the outsiders. It's the biggest problems we've had insiders that have risen up and acted up. But we, we, we're here. We're here. Uh, the liberal false teachers attack the very thing that provides them with the potential of eternal salvation. 24. Theological liberals typically deny the deity of Christ and the necessity of the substitutionary death of Christ. And they parade around as some kind of Christian. They follow in the way of Cain. The first man born to, born to Adam and Eve. The first person. What was he? You know what they saw every day in the garden? They'd bring in their sacrificial animal. Fire had come down and consume it. This is after the fall, of course. Before the fall, that they were just, the Lord appeared in the cool of the day because they were empty vessels. He, had, he taught them. I'm sure he warned them about Lucifer, too. Be on your guard. Anyway, Cain was raised up in that environment. He knew that like clockwork. 
If you took a sacrificial animal and put it out there on that little altar, fire would come down out of heaven and consume it. Cain wouldn't do it. When he grew up, he wouldn't do it. His brother did, Abel. He'd bring all of his nice vegetables and fruit in and think God's going to accept that. He would. There's nothing wrong with vegetables and being a farmer or any of that. It's that this isn't the thing. You need to get a, a legitimate animal, uh, animal and, and bring it in. He wouldn't do it. He piled all his stuff, made it look real pretty, set it all up. No fire came out of heaven. He went out of there mad as hell. And he took it out on his brother one day, unbeknownst to his brother. He committed homicide and killed the first believer to man and woman, righteous Abel, the first guy mentioned in Hebrews 11, in the roster of super grace heroes of the past. It's an interesting roster. These are the ones that found approval. You won't find King Saul in there, and Saul was a believer who was trying to kill David. <clears throat> who wound up took, taking his own life, who was trying to get answers from a witch, the witch of Endor, and the seance that got upset. Samuel comes up from the underworld, and the witch, she practically passes out. Her whole game is exposed. And you know what Samuel said to it, Saul? He said today, I think it's today, you'll be with me. In paradise. What's that tell me? It tells me Saul was a believer. God didn't pick the first king of Israel, an unbeliever out of whole day. He was a good guy at first, and then he went south because he wouldn't kill Amalekites. God gave Israel a mandate to commit genocide against a group of people called Amalekites. They were the first ones to attack Israel up out of Egypt. The first battle Israel had after they got out of Egypt was with these Amalekites. And these were a nasty bunch of people. They were nasty. They were cruel. They wouldn't just kill their prey. They cut them into pieces and throw them in there. They were just off the tracks. God said, get rid of that cancer. In every generation, you see a Amalekite, you kill him. There's whole nations and whole groups of people that have become extinct. It's in a psalm. Because of, their, because of their evil, the level of their evil. Look at the civilizations in South America, the Inca, the Mayan, and some of those. What were they telling you disappear? Well, whatever God used, a plague. And all these people that are fighting Israel out there and calling for their extermination, they're in, they just, just made themselves a target. To Abraham, those who curse you, I will curse. Those who bless you, I will bless. Whether it's the head of, <laughs> whether it's the, head of the UN, <laughs> the current head, I don't know his name, he's not welcome in Israel. You can't come here. Stay away. Good. I go, yeah. Of course, the UN is the product of internationalism. We got it wrapped around us, thanks to the rich insiders in our government, in our, in our country. We got the UN, and we've had more war and more junk since we got them. That's why, this country, that's not just why. That's a part of why. After we're out of here, about two years later, this country is going to be taken out in one hour or one day. And God's going to use Russia to do it. It's in the prophecy. The missiles, the arrows, the flaming arrows from the land of the north. And all your cities, everywhere. And when the dust settles, there won't be one living American left here. That's why one of the announcements right after the rapture, if you're an American, you go back to the country that you immigrated to. The unique thing about the U.S. and prophecy is it's got two characteristics that there's no nation that has both of them. Major economic world power. Oh, 
That's us. Two, the population is built on immigration. And what's the monument that's a symbol of that? The Statue of Liberty, given to us by a French mason. Facing east with the torch. The angel is going to pick up the base. It's like a millstone. It's round. That's what she, sit, she or it sits on. The angel is going to pick that thing up. No mention of the statue. He's going to toss it. He's going to make a speech. And he's going to toss it into the deepest trench in the Atlantic Ocean. Never to be recovered. And that's how you're going down. That's the slap that Americans are going to get. We won't be here. We're, we're going to be in heaven watching the whole breaking of the seven seals over a seven-year period. Seals one, two, three, four are horsemen. Why not the fifth one? Because that's cause and effect, cause and effect. The rider on the white horse with a, with a, with a bow with no arrow and a crown, that's the United States. We all like to portray ourselves as the, as, the, as the righteous one, the white one. we got a white house. White is the color of righteousness. And then the rider on the red horse, that's Russia. And when that seal is broken, they'll launch. All of their sophisticated, they have come so far since the fall of the Soviet Union, technologically and otherwise, it isn't even funny. God's greased their skids. He's going to use them to be his whip nation. And then the rider on the black horse, that's economic stringency over the nations as a result of pulling the plug on the U.S. and the whole house of cards comes down. And the rider on the ashen horse, where is, you think all this nuclear waste that's going to be sucked into the atmosphere is going to go? It's going to be carried by the four winds all over the place, and people are going to be dying of cancer. But it's all under the control of Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of salvation, and he is the Lord of history. Oh, I wonder who's going to be president. Wonder all you want. God's going to do what he's going to do, okay? All right. Maybe we can get through this, and I'll let you go. Uh, Theological liberals deny. They, they follow in the way of Cain. The final statement, bringing swift, swift destruction upon themselves, can only refer to their phase two judgment. As individuals, they will die, and their judgment in hell will be swift and certain. 28, the basis for their condemnation is failure to believe in the master who bought them. John 3, 36. Those who deny the Lord by rejecting his person and work will find themselves in the hands of a living and all-powerful judge. The false teachers operate in the name of Christianity. So far, their profile is as follows. They are rivals to the true teachers of faith. They operate within Christian circles among you. They infiltrate Christian ranks, C. They do this in cemeteries, cemeteries, seminaries. <laughs> Some of them are cemeteries. <laughs> no, they've infiltrated Christian cemeteries, <coughs> Jesuits. Well, I, I read a story about how they, how in one of these Christian seminaries, they, they found, they figured out this guy was a Jesuit. You know who the Jesuits are? Society of Jesus? They're the ones that took Copernicus's model in his room where he had this sun with these poles sticking out and these planets positioned out there. They took it to all the nations and sold it to them. The last nation to sign off on the spinning ball thing was China. It's interesting history. Because the ancients all believed it was flat. Even the pagans, they all believed it was flat. What do you think they're trying to build a tower to reach to heaven if they thought heaven was millions and millions of light years off somewhere? Heaven's a real place. Just as much as this room is. They promote false doctrine, even the denial of who and what Christ is. They are held accountable and will face destruction. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten our positive volition. In Jesus' name. Amen.